the focus, I think, over the last sort of 12 to 15 odd months has very much been balance sheet and liquidity. I think, uh, uh, you know, what, what happened is shortly after we announced our, I think it was, these would have been half year results uh, um, just prior to the onset of COVID in about March, April uh, 2020. We had just declared a dividend. We had uh, something like 3.4 billion rand flowing out of the company. And, you know, that was, we, we met with shareholders in Cape Town and presented the results. That was on the Friday. On the Sunday, the president first spoke about lockdown. And on the Monday, I think we were in literally level five lockdown from zero or not even thinking about lockdown to, to complete shutdown. So a big shock to the system, you know, having to deal with, uh, with liquidity, paying out, you know, big quantums of cash. Um, needing to obviously, uh, you know, find access to, to, to further liquidity when the bond markets were closing down, the banks were supportive, but obviously, you know, um, you know also conscious of the times. So yes, I think a, a huge emphasis was just on, on liquidity. As you know, we did an equity raise towards the back end of, of 2020. Um, with our dividend reduction, we decided to cut back a little bit on our dividend payout ratio. We had the drip, the distribution reinvestment, all up, we, we managed to sort of um, gather in the order of about 6 billion rands worth of liquidity, which I think has certainly stood us in good stead and has positioned us, I think, to, you know, to see us through not only the second wave, which happened in December, but we're now in the midst of the third wave. Uh, who knows what's still ahead? But we're pretty confident that, you know, whatever we did to the balance sheet or with the balance sheet is going to see us through whatever challenges uh, might still be on the horizon. Little did we think, I guess, as well, that uh, the asset that would be most negatively impacted uh, of all the assets we own, whether it be domestically and or our international businesses, uh, would, would be the V&A waterfront of, you know, of all things. I mean, uh, with the lack of international tourists arriving in the country, uh, again, perhaps a bit of an eye-opener for us just as to how dependent the waterfront is on international tourism. Uh, you know, the, the, the sectors within the waterfront, thankfully, it's a very diversified asset in and of itself. So the office sector hasn't really been impacted. Um, the industrial sector has not been affected at all. Uh, it's mainly in the retail and leisure, uh, let's say, sectors that we've seen. When I say leisure, I'm talking the, the hospitality, but also the, the hotels. And uh, that's where we felt the most pain. We, we're reasonably optimistic, I guess, you know, that towards the end of the year and early into next year, as vaccinations, you know, people around the world get vaccinated and South Africa makes some progress, uh, you know, on that front as well, that tourism will come back. Um, in fact, we're confident that leisure tourism, you may even find that there's a pent up demand for leisure tourism post all of this lockdown and, and, and restrictions. The one area that remains a bit of a concern is business tourism. So, you know, you think of the convention center, Cape Town Convention Center, all the conferences that, that used to take place there, mining conference in, in Darba, all that sort of stuff. That, I think, is going to take a bit longer, maybe, you know, if ever, you know, sort of recover to, to what it was. We have prioritized those tenants that are most impacted. Um, in many instances, we've come to an agreement with them to actually mothball their space and to just park the rental, you know, for now that we won't be charging rental while the space is mothballed. Uh, you know, for the hotel industry, you know, most of the hotel tenants we've uh, provided relief to in terms of um, taking into account, you know, the level of their own operations and what they can and can't do you know, based on the, the restrictions imposed by government. So, um, I you know, there is no doubt that, you know, some tenants will undoubtedly fail, notwithstanding the support we've been providing. Um, I'd hate, I don't want to call it a wave, or I wouldn't like to think of it as a wave of tenants going bust um, and having to withdraw. Um, but, you know, if I can just quote two statistics that we've recently published, um, you know, in 2019, I'm talking the 12 months to, to December 19, I think we had about 13 uh, tenants uh, across our entire portfolio that went into business rescue or liquidation. The associated write-off with that was in order of about 6.4 million rand. Um, the 12 months to December 2020, that number was 39 uh, tenants that went into business rescue or liquidation, and the associated write-off of that with that was about 134 million. So it's big. It is a major concern of uh, you know for us. 
um, quite broadly the, the state of the South African economy, you know, beyond just, you know, what COVID's brought about. We were already in a, in a weak economic environment before. So um, it is a worry, Bronwyn, and yeah, we can, um, you know, we can only provide, you know, so much relief. And then I guess we, you know, we would uh, ourselves need to need to consider you know, other options. But um, for now, we, we cautiously optimistic that we can keep going for a, you know, for a while along these lines. I mean, we've seen the worst and I think the current sort of restrictions is not as bad as we saw right at the outset. And um, so we, we hope that, you know, we can't, we don't go back to that uh, environment. The debate that is raging around what commercial, uh, the prospects for commercial property look like going forward. And here, you know, pulling in specifically the office debate, with many organizations realizing that a large proportion of their, uh, their work environment can actually be conducted virtually rather than in a physical central location, as was our belief, Norbert, before COVID-19 hit. I think people are exploring numerous options and certainly some of the stats I'm hearing from top tier CEOs in, in the top 40 uh, are that going forward, the virtual component will possibly be the dominant component of uh, a business or an organization's mode of operation. Give me your sense and, and whether, you know, we, we're just gonna see office uh, space now imploding left, right and center as, as corporates bail and realize there's a different way of conducting their business. Obviously, Brown, I actually talked to my book, <laughs> as you'll appreciate. But um, look, I'd, uh, you know, I'd like to sort of quote some of the um, I don't know, global CEOs of some of the largest investment banks in the world. Two of them recently quoted work from home as, as an aberration. Um, now that's the one extreme. I think on the other extreme, you have situations where, you know, corporates are saying, well, there's absolutely no need for an office anymore. We can do everything virtually. We certainly have proven that it can be done. You know, certainly during the, the most part of 2020, uh, I worked from home. Um, since the beginning of, 20, uh, you know, 21, I've been, I've returned to the office. So it can be done. There's no doubt about it. Is it optimal? Does it help in terms of productivity? Uh, can you inculcate a culture, uh, a value system? Uh, can you mentor? Can you do all of those things? Uh, no, you know, virtually, short answer to my mind is no. Having returned to the office, it's very difficult to explain to somebody just how different it is, but it is very different in terms of the way you operate, the way you interact with your peers, your colleagues, uh, et cetera. So, um, I think the way it's going to play out, Bronwyn, is that every single corporate, large or small, are going to adopt a work from home policy. Some may be as extreme as to say, you don't have to come to the office ever. Others are going to say, I want you back nine to five. I think you're going to find something in between. Uh, the, the, the bottom line is flexibility. I think you are going to have to be more flexible as an employer. You're going to have to provide, you know, flexibility. If you want to keep your top talent, you are going to have to introduce some element of flexibility. But I think in the long, in the long run, to my mind, um, you know, I, again, each different, each business is different, and the requirements are different. But for you know, certainly a very large portion of our customer base, I think the the need to return to the office, the need to engage on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, uh, and to, to, to drive culture values, those sorts of things can only happen in a physical environment. Now, you know, on the one hand, you know, it's probably on balance, I'd say all of it is maybe net negative in terms of demand, but there is a little bit of a counterbalance to my mind is which, which, which talks to the need for maybe a little bit more space between you and your colleague. You know, we saw the trend over the last four or five years you know, corporates were allocating 15 square meters per person. That became 12, it became 10, it became eight. I think at the peak of the WeWork business model cycle, they were working on six square meters per person. I think you revert back, maybe not to 15, but maybe you get back to 10 or something. You know, if you are going to be in the office, you don't want to be sitting on top of your colleague. You don't necessarily want to have screens everywhere, but you want enough space. And, and that will be a bit of a counterbalance between, you know, to the argument of, you know, uh, massive space reduction and everybody's working from home. 
So net negative, but I don't think you know in a catastro catastrophic way as as some commentators might suggest.